Remote Learning Adjustment. Um, this is Part B of our last section. Um, so in Part A, we talked about these three topics. Uh, review of Lewis structures, some exceptions to the octet rules, resonance, as well as formal charge. Um, today we will be focusing on our last section in our um, <clears throat> chapter 8, which is Vesper theory. So today we're going to kind of put all those pieces together to talk about Vesper theory. Vesper is an acronym for valence shell electron pair repulsion. Um, this is a really <clears throat> big word uh, or words, but if we break it down, we can kind of talk about and understand what this is really about. Valence shell. We know that valence shell uh, is that outermost shell of our atom, and the electrons in that valence shell are the ones that uh, go do the chemistry, right? Those are the ones that add on, they leave, those are the ones that are shared between atoms to fill octets. So right there, we're talking about the valence shell electrons. Pair repulsion. So when we draw electrons, we know that we're going to have pairs at a time, right? So when we have an octet, think of your Lewis dot diagram. We have two electrons in each quadrant around whatever symbol of the element we have. And we know that each electron is a negative charge. So it makes sense that <clears throat> these electrons in this outer shell, in the valence shell, they don't really want to hang out next to each other because they all have minus charges. So they repulse each other. So we're going to talk about this concept that where the valence shell electrons are in that outer shell, they're kind of designed to be in certain places around that spherical outer shell, right? Think of it kind of like a sphere. Where, does they, where do they exist in that 3D sphere? They're going to try and be as far away from each other as possible while still being tethered to that central atom. Um, and the number of valence shell electron pairs or groups of electrons will determine kind of the arrangement that they take to kind of be as far away from each other as possible. So the best way I can describe this is think of like a dog walker. If you've ever seen a professional dog walker where they have the leash like belt, like there's a belt with all the leashes for all the dogs around their center, we can think of the person as the atom. And all the dogs on the leashes are the electrons. Um, and let's just say these dogs aren't friendly with each other. So they're not going to bite each other, but they don't want to hang out, okay? So they're going to try and be as far away from each other as possible. So clearly, if we only had two dogs that the walker was walking, they would be as far away from each other as possible. So they'd be 180 degrees away from each other, right? They'd be on opposite sides of the person. One on the left, one on the right, or one in front and one behind. Now, if we had three dogs, um, they're going to try and be as far away from each other as possible, but they're going to have to be closer, right? Because we have an extra dog now. So we can't be 180 degrees away from each other. Maybe now instead they're 120 degrees away from each other, right? Evenly split three ways around. So we're going to talk about this model, and obviously instead of people and dogs, we're going to be talking about atoms and their electron groups. <clears throat> and when we know where the electrons, these valence shell electrons are um, on the atom, like where they're physically placed, um, that helps us predict where the bond would be made. Does that make sense? Think about that for a second. If we know the position, like in 3D space, where those uh, electrons are pointed, those valence shell electrons are pointed, then we know where the bond that is made when we have a covalent bond occur, where it points out at the central atom. And where it points out, once all those bonds are made, that makes a shape of our molecule. So Vesper theory is really this idea of using this concept of electrons like to repulse each other, and the more we have, they're going to have to kind of arrange themselves differently. And wherever those electrons live, right, and are positioned, that's where a bond would form. And if we know where the bond would form, then we can predict what shape the overall molecule would have. So we're going to be talking about molecular structures um, in 3D space. Now, for some people, this might be very, very hard to visualize. Um, in our extra help section, I have a lot of resources available for you for this. Um, a couple of them include some really good free simulators. So if you have a model kit at home, um, that will be a really great resource for you. If you don't, um, I got you covered. There is a free simulation software you can use, which basically will make and look like the model kit, 
and you can build it and it'll tell you all the geometries and you can twist it and turn it around and kind of get some spatial idea of what these look like. <clears throat> Um, the main idea that we're going to talk about with this is that <clears throat> we are going to have to deal with bonding electrons and non-bonding electron pairs. When we say non-bonding electron pairs, we're talking about lone pairs. And bonding um, pairs would be the electrons that are in a bond. And that all of these electrons, whether they're part of a bond or part of a lone pair set, they want to be as far away from each other as possible. Just like our dogs with the dog walker. So the first structure we're going to talk about is a linear structure. And this would be, here's our person, and here's our two dogs. Um, obviously, a molecular example of this would be uh, beryllium chloride. And what we have here is our central beryllium and two chlorines. There are only two groups here, two electron groups. The electron pair, bonding pair that are in this bond, and the electron bonding pair that are in this bond. And so for them to be as far away from each other as possible in 3D space would be 180 degrees away from each other. So this is literally a line. So pretend you have a 2 by 4 um, Put a dot in the center of the 2 by 4 That's where our beryllium is. And then each end of the 2 by 4 uh, is where our chlorides would reside. So it's flat, planar, and symmetrical. Does everyone see that I could take a knife and cut through it this way? I could take a knife and cut through it this way. No matter how I do it, I evenly cut everything about this molecule. The next is what we would call a trigonal planar structure. Trigonal standing for three. One, two, three. Um, planar meaning they're all flat. The best way I found to describe this would be like uh, the fidget spinners, where it's a flat plane Right, like you could lay it down like a pancake, and it's got three little, uh, like spinny things on the edges, and then you would put your finger here in the center. Right, so this is what we would call a trigonal planar structure. Planar means flat, so planar like a pancake, like a CD, flat, like your hand when you lay it out flat. It has a top and a bottom to it. Um, so right now you could pretend that we are looking at this from overhead. This is this is our dog walker. This is the top of our dog walker's head. Here's the top of one of the dogs, another dog, and a third dog. Okay, So we're looking down on this, like we're a bird in a tree looking at this dog walker walking by. Again, we have uh, three different electron groups now. One, two, three. They're all tied into bonds, so they're all bonding groups. And they want to be as far away from each other again as possible, but there's more of them now. So instead of just two groups where they got to be 180 degrees away from each other, now there's three groups. So we're down to about 120 degrees away from each other. <clears throat> the next structure is tetrahedral. This is the first example where we're not going to have a planar structure. We talked about tetrahedral a little earlier. Um, the best way to describe it is if you look at the blue lines here, think of this as like... Um, the pyramids in Giza, like the Great Pyramids, um, they have a triangular base and it makes a pyramid, so it comes up um, to a point, um, just like the pyramids do. Um, and then what you could think is <clears throat> that each of the points in this blue triangle would represent, in this case we're talking about CH4, this is a hydrogen, here's a hydrogen, here's a hydrogen, here's a hydrogen. And the carbon is in the very center of it, like in, in the center of the pyramid. Um, so like I said, this is the first time we're seeing something where it is not planar, okay? This, this uh, has um, 3D space taking up here. We have uh, stuff on the bottom that makes a base and then a peak at it. So this is a representation of <clears throat> that tetrahedral structure where we have the carbon in the center, and this is also showing hybridization that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, where we have the carbon in the center and the hydrogens around it. Um, oftentimes this is represented, if you wanted a good way to visualize this for yourself, um, stand up in your room, put one foot in front and one foot behind you, like you're almost trying to do a split, and put your arms up in the air, straight, one to the left and one to the right. Um, and in that case, your core would be the center. Each of these would be your arms going to the left and right, and this foot would be coming out front, and this foot would be going behind. Now, this is turned on its side, but that's still the same representation of that. 
So how do we figure out these 3D structures of our molecules? Um, we're going to apply some concepts of Vesper theory to make this happen. First and foremost, you have to be able to draw a correct Lewis structure. So everything we did in the previous video, um, all the rules of drawing Lewis structures, being able to use formal charge to determine which is the correct Lewis structure, got to be able to do that. We can't go on to um, figuring out 3D geometries um, or 3D shapes of our molecules until we have a correct Lewis structure. Um, so first and foremost, you have to become a Lewis structure champ. Um, so really, really do um, work on that practice. Look at the extra help. I gave a lot of resources for that. And then we're going to count the electron pairs that arrange themselves um, in a way that minimizes repulsion. So what we're talking about here is we're going to count how many different electronic groups there are. This would be either a lone pair or a bonded pair. How many different groups are there and where are they located? Um, and then lastly, um, from determining how many electronic groups there are and how many um, bonding groups there are, we can determine a molecular structure. Um, we can also determine an electronic structure, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's use water as an example. Um, if you feel relatively comfortable with this, you can pause right here and try drawing it out yourself, but I will walk through this example. Now obviously we're working in a remote situation right now, um, so the, the ability for me to tell you things like you have to memorize and know um, these different shapes, uh, the electronic geometries and the molecular geometries. Uh, I can't do that because on a test or a quiz, I know you have access to your textbook and the internet. I will make this note though. You will need to know these for Chem 201. So if you plan to go ahead and take Chem 201 and you haven't bothered to memorize these, you will have a problem later on. So please take this seriously and put in the effort to make flashcards, do what you need to do to internalize this information now. So let's look at a water molecule. We're first going to draw the correct Lewis structure of a water molecule. We know that the oxygen <clears throat> has two bonds and two lone pairs. Each hydrogen is satisfied with only two electrons. The central atom has two, four, six, eight electrons, so he's happy. This is a correct Lewis structure for our um, water molecule. Then we need to go through and identify how many different electron pairs are there. Well, I look and I count, there's a pair of electrons in this bond, so that's one. There's a pair of electrons in this bond, that's two. And there's a lone pair up here, that would be three. And there's a lone pair down here. So there are four pairs of electrons in this. Two of them come from bonding, and two of them come from non-bonding, or lone pairs. So when we have four different groups um, around our central atom, these pairs best arrange in that tetrahedral form. So we're looking like this. Um, in this case, two of these groups are lone pairs, so we can arbitrarily say this is a lone pair group here, and this is a lone pair group here, and that this is a hydrogen down here, and this is a hydrogen down here. So if you were, you know, standing up right now and kind of holding your hands and feet in that position, pretend that your hands are your lone pairs and that your feet are your um, hydrogen atoms. And that should give you a pretty good idea, right? And then again, the oxygen is your core. Please keep in mind, all of these shapes that we're talking about, these geometries, both electronic and molecular geometries that we're going to learn about, um, you have to remember that we're only talking about one atom at a time. We can't talk about a whole molecule. So in this molecule, it's pretty easy because there's only one central atom. So we're talking about the shape around the oxygen in reference to everything else. But when we start having more complex molecules, we might have more than one central atom, and we could actually determine a shape for each of those atoms. So let's look again, right? We said, okay, we're cool with the idea that we're going to have two lone pairs and two bonded pairs for a total of four electronic groups. We said that this structure would be tetrahedral in shape. This is what we call the electronic geometry or the electronic shape because it's how many electronic groups there are and where those electronic groups are organized. But because there are lone pairs, the lone pairs don't really add to the molecule, to the shape. It just kind of bends things. 
So there's a different shape for what we call the molecular geometry or the molecular shape. And for water, that shape is called V-shaped or sometimes referred to as bent. It basically looks like a boomerang. We know that both of the lone pairs are hanging out up here. And what they do is when the lone pairs are up here, instead of having these two hydrogens be linear, like a CO2 molecule, or the BeCl2 molecule that is in the extra uh, help section, what we see is because these lone pairs are sitting up here, they're very self-important, and what they do is squish our hydrogens down. So they can't be linear, and instead they form this like V-shape, this bent shape instead. So the electronic geometry for water is tetrahedral. The molecular geometry for water is bent. So, like we said, lone pairs require more room than bonding pairs. And so they're very self-important and they push everybody down. So they make everybody accommodate them. And in doing so, they compress the angle between the bonded pairs. <clears throat> so if we had a linear molecule like we had here, right, that's only two electronic groups. If we have three electronic groups, that's trigonal planar, right? Two dogs, three dogs. Now we're at Four dogs doesn't really make sense because this would mean that there was a dog floating in space. So now go to your concept of like uh, the Great Pyramids of Giza, right? Three at the base to make a triangle and one pointing up at top. Actually, I think the Giza pyramids actually have a square base. We'll see that too. But pretend this is just a pyramid with a triangular base for now, okay? And one up top. And again, remember, these are all electronic pairs that we're looking at. The only time the electronic geometry or the electronic shape will be different than the molecular shape is when we have lone pairs present. And we'll look at some more examples of that as we keep moving forward. The other two, so we're up to five electronic groups now. Now we go to trigonal bipyramidal. And this may sound like a really big fancy word, but go back to our tetrahedral for a second. Remember, here's the base of our triangle. There was three and one was pointing on top. Here's the base of the triangle with three and one pointing on top. And now we're just going to have one pointing on the bottom as well. So here's our base triangle of three with the one on top. And now right below it, we have an extra one. Okay, so this is not that complex of a shape. It may look really strange here, um, but we just need to kind of uh, visualize in our head what we're looking at. And again, those simulators I have are going to be really useful for this. Now, um, I just want to bring in some new definitions so that we could determine what uh, molecules we're talking or what atoms in this molecule we're talking about. Around the center where these three are, this would be called the equatorial axis. Just like the equator of the Earth, right, if you think of the central atom as the equator, this, uh, uh, excuse me, as the Earth, this would be the equator going around it. Does everybody see that? That this would be what we call the equatorial axis, this flat line, you know, circular disk around. The ones that are on top and bottom, we call this the axial um, plane or the axial um uh, uh, molecules, or excuse me, axial atoms. Sorry about that. So equatorial atoms, axial atoms. And this is like an axis, right? Again, pretend this is the Earth, and it would spin around on this axis, and this would be the equator. So again, if we were trying to say, uh, you know, pick out who or where, let's say right now we have five, uh, let's say this is PCl5. We know phosphorus can break the octet rule, and so this is a phosphorus with five uh, chlorines around it. Um, but let's say we had something like PCl4. Where would the lone pair add? We would be able to then describe, does it add axially, which means we would have a lone pair somewhere around the center three here, or does it add, equ um, or excuse me, does it add equatorially, my, my bad, sorry, does it add equatorially, does it add around the center here, or does it add axially? where the lone pair would be added on either the top or the bottom, okay? So we have axial and equatorial. The last shape would have six electronic groups around it, and we call this octahedral. And what ends up happening here is we still have two groups in our axial positions, but instead of having three like we do in trigonal bipyramidal, we now have four groups around our um, equatorial position.
Okay, so we will go into more detail with this, but please keep in mind that all of these groups, number of electron pair groups that we're talking about, um, these shapes are only for the electronic arrangement. When we start adding lone pairs in, we're going to have different names um, for our molecular arrangements. So again, let's look at our tetrahedral structure. Let's go back to four electronic groups. So let's pretend this is CH4, right? So the A represents a carbon, and each of these Bs represents a hydrogen. We know that that means there are four electronic groups around this central atom, this carbon, and there are four bonding groups around the carbon as well, which means that the electronic geometry and the molecular geometry are both tetrahedral. So the trick here in memorizing these is that when we have no lone pairs, whatever the electronic geometry is, that's what the molecular geometry is. But once we have lone pairs, we're going to have different um, molecular geometries, or as your book calls it, molecular structures. So here's an example of that. Now we have a central atom that has three bonding pairs and one lone pair. Electronically, this is still tetrahedral for its geometry. Molecularly, though, we call this trigonal pyramidal. And then the example we saw with water, right, this would be an oxygen, two bonding pairs, two lone pairs. And that means that tetrahedral is the electronic geometry, because there's still four electronic groups, but for the molecular geometry or the molecular shape, we call this V-shaped, also bent. Both of those are perfectly acceptable um, descriptions of the molecular geometry. <clears throat> so that's a, a quick description of the different types of um, groupings that we'll have for our trig or excuse me for our tetrahedral. We can have the same thing occur in trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral, right? We know that trigonal bipyramidal means we have five electronic groups. But sometimes those electronic groups will be bonding, and sometimes they will be non-bonding, or lone pairs. And that will have different names for the molecular geometries when there's lone pairs. Same thing with the octahedral, where we have six groups. So, <clears throat> when we're looking at um, our trigonal bipyramidal, five groups around our central atom. If we have five groups around our central atom that are all bound, the electronic geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, and the molecular geometry would be trigonal bipyramidal. When we have one lone pair, the electronic geometry is still trigonal bipyramidal, but now we call the molecular geometry seesaw because there's a lone pair sitting here. Um, so as you can see, when we have five groups around our central atom, the uh, lone pairs will add equatorially, okay? The lone pairs will always go around the equator, okay? So, <clears throat> when we have two lone pairs on a five uh, electron pair, or excuse me, electron group molecule, we'll have a second lone pair add to equatorially. Um, the molecular shape for that is what we call T-shaped, and it's literally because it looks like a T, like a T on its side. And then lastly, we can have up to three lone pairs in something that has five electronic groups around it. And in this case, all three of the equatorial positions now have lone pairs in them, which means the only place where we have molecule, like uh, atoms being bound together or is in the axial position, which would lead us to have a molecular shape that is linear. <clears throat> Here is our next door question. So this is... Uh, again, just like we said in the last couple videos, just like in class where I provided a door question for you, um, here is your next door question. It might show up on a test or a quiz, so it's a good idea to start munching on uh, a good answer for it. All right, so let's start playing around with this a little bit. When phosphorus reacts uh, with chlorine gas, we produce PCl5. We already did an example with this, right? In the gaseous and liquid state, the substances consist of PCl5. In the solid state, it consists of a one-to-one -one mixture of PCl4 with a plus charge and PCl6 with a minus charge. Predict the geometries for all three of these different structures. So 
we're going to have three different structures here. The first thing we always need to do is draw the Lewis structure. So we'll start with PCL5 and we'll draw the Lewis structure of PCL5. So once we have our correct Lewis structure for PCL5, we're going to determine how many electronic groups are around this central atom. I count one, two, three, four. There are five electronic groups around here. So we know when there are five electronic groups that the electronic geometry would be trigonal bipyramidal. Now, because none of these electronic groups are lone pairs, the molecular geometry is also trigonal bipyramidal. Now, let's do our PCL4 cation. So again, when we're drawing Lewis structures, we need to make sure that we draw a Lewis structure correctly. You need to follow all the rules to get your PCL4 cation, which looks something like this. So now we're going to go through and determine the electronic geometry and the molecular geometry of this molecule. Let's go back for a sec. So the first thing we need to do is identify how many electronic groups are around our central atom. I count one, two, three, four electronic groups. That's it. So we know when we have four electronic groups, that's going to give us a tetrahedral electronic geometry. Now again, in this case, there are no lone pairs. All of these electronic groups are bonding groups, which means our molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. Electronic geometry, tetrahedral. Molecular geometry, tetrahedral. Lastly, the PCL6 with uh, the anion. So again, we have to draw a proper Lewis structure. Now when we go to identify how many electronic groups are around our central atom here, one, two, three, four, five, we have six electronic groups around this structure. So when we know we have six electronic groups, we're going to have an octahedral, oops, sorry, octahedral electronic geometry. And again, the number of electronic groups is the same as the number of bonding groups. So we have an octahedral electronic geometry and an octahedral molecular geometry. Now, we're going to go through and talk some more about some different ways that these predictions occur. And again, we have to kind of keep in mind, this is all based off of the orbitals, right? That we're going to have s and p orbitals, because that's where our valence shell electrons are. Predominantly for this class, we won't be dealing with transition metals with this, so you don't have to get into any um, kooky situations with that. So we're dealing predominantly with the s and p orbitals, um, because this is where our valence shell electrons are. And <clears throat> this will help us kind of determine these different structures. So I would like you right now to predict whether um, this structure is going to have a dipole moment. So now we're going to add in some of the polarity we talked about earlier. We know that um, different amounts of groups of electronic groups, and whether they're bonding or non-bonding, affect where the lone pairs hang out, right? and if it's a polar bond or a nonpolar bond. So what we're going to be able to do now is go, okay, if I can figure out the Lewis structure of my molecule, I can figure out the geometry, the electronic geometry of it. If I can figure out the electronic geometry, I can figure out the molecular geometry. If I know the molecular geometry and I analyze it to look at which bonds are polar and which ones aren't, I should be able to determine whether the overall molecule has a dipole moment. Or to say, I can figure out if a molecule is polar or nonpolar. So that's where we're going to tie all of this together. To determine whether a molecule is polar or not, we have to know its Lewis structure. We have to know its Lewis structure so that we can get its electronic geometry. If we have its electronic geometry, we can get its molecular geometry. And from the molecular geometry, we can analyze it to determine whether or not the molecule has a dipole moment, which would make it polar. So go ahead and start working on your xenon trifluoride or tetrafluoride. This is our Lewis structure of oops sorry. This is our Lewis structure of xenon tetrafluoride. Four fluorines around it, xenon in the center, and two lone pairs. So let's go through and determine our electronic geometry for xenon tetrafluoride. There's one, two, three, four bonding groups plus one, two non-bonding non groups for a total of 
six electronic groups around this central atom. Can you see all six central, um, excuse me, can you see all six electronic groups around the central atom? Two from the lone pairs, four from the fluorines. So when we have six electronic groups around our central atom, we know that the electronic geometry of this molecule is octahedral and looks something like this. Now, we need to go and look at octahedral and say, okay, but I have lone pairs here. Our lone pairs, just like in our trigonal bipyramidal, our lone pairs are going to add equatorially around this molecule. So our four fluorines are going to be in these positions, and two of the lone pairs will exist in the equatorial position, which leads to this structure here, if we go equatorially. Now, this looks kind of weird. Right? Unlike our trigonal bipyramidal where we had um, <clears throat> uh, only three around our central, or excuse me, around our equatorial axis, now we have four. So instead, let's see what would happen if we added our lone pairs axially. If I add my lone pairs axially, right, put them in the axial positions, that means my four fluorines could exist like this which would give me a molecular structure that looks something like this. Which to you looks more likely in terms of favorability and stability? Hopefully you're thinking more along these lines, which would be correct. So when we have an, oh, excuse me, so when we have an octahedral structure that looks like this, we would call this molecular shape square planar. It's a flat, planar pancake style kind of thing. It's super flat, but it has a square base to it. Okay, so unlike trigonal planar, where it looked like the fidget spinner and kind of like a triangle, right? This is just like a flat square. So again, we need to be able to be comfortable with this idea that the lone pairs on a molecule will affect the different molecular shapes. And what we want to look at is where are they going to add. The trick here is in trigonal bipyramidal, the lone pairs will add equatorially. And in octahedral, the lone pairs will add um, axially. So like we said in the, the example that we had of xenon tetrafluoride, we end up with an electronic geometry, which is octahedral, and a molecular geometry, which is square planar. <clears throat> now, again, here's our xenon. In here, each of these yellowish greenish balls are our fluorines. So now the question that we were asked is, does it have a bi dipole moment? So we know that the xenon would be our partially positive and each fluorine, which we know is the most electronegative atom in the entire periodic table, these would be our slightly negatives. Or we could write these with our polarity arrows where the tail uh, is pointed towards the xenon and the head of the arrow for the slightly negative side is pointed towards the fluorines. So let's go back to our example or our analogy we had earlier for dipole moments and polarity of polar bonds and polar molecules where we talked about this idea of tug of war. So in this case, we have four fluorines. So that's like four football players. They're all the same size and the same strength. And they're all pulling in equal but opposite directions. So is there any way I could cut this molecule up? Is there any direction I could cut it in where all of a sudden I would be able to say, yep, I found a portion where I have all slightly positive and a portion where I have all slightly negative. No, I can't because this molecule is symmetrical. So this molecule has no dipole moment to it. So even though there are four polar bonds, the overall molecule is not polar. Let's look at something with multiple bonds because up until now we've been dealing only with single bonds and that's pretty easy to determine how many electronic groups there are. So let's look at the NO3 minus ion. We know from our last video that we have resonance structures here and it doesn't really matter which one um, you use as long as they're all equivalent to each other. So again, if you come up with non-equivalent Lewis structures for the same molecule, you're going to have to use formal charge first to determine which is our best option. So let's look at this one right here. Let's count how many electronic groups 
are around the central atom, nitrogen. We have one electronic group here in the form of this bond and one electronic group here in the form of this bond. Now we get to our double bond and you may be going, oh, well there's two electronic groups here because we have this one and this one. That's not really the case. Would you agree that all four electrons in this double bond are all pointed in the same direction? Right? They're all going to this oxygen. So we count this as one electronic group. So the trick is when you have a multiple bond, whether it's a double bond or a triple bond, that counts as one electronic group. So around this central nitrogen, there are only one, two, three electronic groups, which would make this electronic structure trigonal planar, just like we see here. Now we simplified it where we made each of these look like a single bond, but we could put another line here to represent our double bond and it would still have the same structure to it. So electronically, it is trigonal planar and the molecular geometry is also trigonal planar because there's no lone pairs. The double bond does not affect the number of electronic groups. So the way we can say that, we say multiple bonds, so this would be a double bond or a triple bond, count as one effective electron pair or one elect electron group. When a molecule exhibits resonance, any one of the resonance structures can be used to predict the, valence, uh, the Vesper model. So basically, as long as your <clears throat> resonance structures, like we have in the previous here, these are all equivalent to each other, just pick one. You don't need to do it for all three. Just pick one. It will be a good representation of all of them. <clears throat> so this is getting into a... Um, kind of very beefy question. Predict the molecular structure of sulfur dioxide. Is this molecule expected to have a dipole moment? So we need to start off by going sulfur dioxide. All right, I'm going to have to draw a Lewis structure of this first. Then I'll have to determine the electronic geometry. Then I'll have to determine the molecular geometry. Then from that I can determine whether it has polar or nonpolar bonds, where they're pointed, and then from that, I can determine whether I have a dipole moment. So if you want to pause the video here and try this on your own, I would strongly encourage you to do so. So when we first look at the valence shell, or excuse me, when we first look at the Lewis structure for SO2, we count up our total number of valence shell electrons using all of our rules for drawing Lewis structures, and we come up with two resonance structures. These are identical equivalent uh, Lewis structures to each other. So we can use just one of them moving ahead with our geometry. So let's use this guy here. So we determine the molecular structure. We first need the electronic geometry. So we look at our central atom, which in this case is our sulfur. And I count one electronic group here, the lone pair, one electronic group here. And even though this is a double bond, right, this counts as one electronic group here. So we have one, two, three electronic groups around our central atom, which would give us an electronic geometry of trigonal planar. However, when we go to do our molecular geometry, we now have a lone pair here. So this is not going to be trigonal planar in our molecular geometry. What we're going to have happen is this lone pair, right, if it was a, another bound oxygen, let's say, we would be perfectly 120 degrees away from each other. However, it's a lone pair, so it's going to make these two oxygens squish closer together. So it's going to be actually a little less than 120 degrees apart from each other. And you don't need to memorize the exact number for each of these. You would just say it's less than 120 degrees. And because there's a lone pair sitting here, the molecular shape for this would be V-shaped or bent. So this will look just like H2O. Um, now we have SO2. It will be V-shaped or bent, kind of like a boomerang. So now we need to think about our dipole moments. We need to think about polarity. We know that in each case, we have a polar bond between the S and the O, where the slightly positive is here and the slightly negative is here. We have a polar bond between this S and this O, where the slightly positive is here and the slightly negative is here. So I could take a knife and I could cut across 
right here. And I'd have all my slightly positive down here, and I'd have all my slightly negative up here. So we have an overall dipole moment for this compound, primarily because of the V-shape. It's not linear, so I can cut straight across and say here's all my slightly negative up here, here's all my slightly negative, or excuse me, all my slightly positive up here, and all my slightly, oh boy, sorry about that guys. If I cut across here, this is my slightly positive up here, nope. This is my slightly negative up here, and this is my slightly positive down here. Sorry about that, folks. Um, and in which case, this overall molecule would be polar. Our polar bonds will not cancel out. We can look at a more complex molecule. Remember how we said sometimes we won't have one central atom? In this case, there are two central atoms. So we can figure out the electronic geometry and the molecular geometry of each of these central atoms. Um, we could also look at the overall molecule and determine whether or not it's polar. Um, so the molecular structure, right, that molecular geometry, can only be done individually. We can look at the carbon and see what it has going on, and we can look at the oxygen and see what it has going on. So <clears throat> when we look at our carbon, we count one, two, three, four electronic groups around our carbon, no lone pairs. So the electronic geometry for this carbon would be tetrahedral. The molecular geometry for this carbon would be tetrahedral. We look at the oxygen. I count one, two bonding pairs, one, two lone pairs for a total of four electronic groups around the oxygen. So electronically, this is also tetrahedral. However, because we have lone pairs, right? We have two lone pairs this oxygen will be bent in its molecular shape. And that's what we see here, right? Here's our carbon um, and its tetrahedral shape around here. Here's our oxygen, and this is tetrahedral for electronic and molecular geometries. Here's the electronic geometry around our oxygen. It's again tetrahedral. However, because we know that the oxygen has two lone pairs, it's bent. So we get this overall looking shape like this for the molecule. So some of the advantages of the VESPER model. It really helps us predict the overall structure of our molecule, whether it is small or more complex. We can go through and get an overall shape of what our molecule would look like. If we know the overall shape of our molecule, we can start determining things like whether the molecule has a dipole moment, whether the overall molecule is polar or not. And this helps us <clears throat> predict way, way big, hundreds of atoms um, in size molecules. So we can start using this as a way to really start understanding some really big complex molecules. However, there are some shortcomings to it, okay? Um, for example, it won't always give us the best prediction. Um, these are exceptions to the rule. 99% of the time, especially what we're doing in our class, um, VESPER is a very reliable um, model. Here we have an example between pH3 and NH3. We would know that when we have pH3, right, um, we would predict the molecular structure of pH3 to be similar to NH3, right, that we would have both of these would be tetrahedral because they have four electronic groups around them for their electronic geometry and that we would have um, our lone pair in both cases, so we'd be trigonal pyramidal for our molecular geometries which would give us a uh, bonding angles around 107 um, degrees however that's not really the case when we actually um, experimentally get crystals of each of these solid compounds we see that the NH3 does follow that very nice um, trigonal pyramidal shape where we have a 107 degree um, <clears throat> shape. However, our phosphorus does not. Um, we end up being significantly smaller around 94 degrees. So it won't always be perfect, um, but it is a very reliable uh, model to use. So this would be a really good time um, for you to pause the video and start answering this question. This requires you to basically go through all the different steps that we've learned in chapter eight so far. So I would encourage you to pause right here and be able to determine which of these molecules is polar.
we find out that NF3 is our polar molecule, right? A polar molecule results from a species with a non-zero dipole moment, so something that has a dipole. To figure out if it di has a dipole, we need to know the molecular shape. To get the molecular shape, we need the electronic geometry. To get the electronic geometry, you have to draw the right Lewis structure. So it all builds on top of each other. To get whether you have a dipole moment, you need to know which bonds are polar and which bonds are not polar. So when we look at um, our options here, the only one where we have um, a dipole moment is NF3 because NF3 is trigonal pyramidal in its, in its molecular geometry. So we will have three of our fluorines with polar bonds pointing out and our nitrogen sitting at top. Which of the following molecules does not have a dipole moment? So again, I would encourage you to pause here, go through and try build, uh, drawing the Lewis structures out, identifying the molecular geometries and, uh, and the electronic geometries for each of these, and then looking at the bonds, seeing which ones are polar, which ones are nonpolar, and determining which ones of these have a dipole moment. In this case, uh, xenon. Uh, dihydride um, is our best option. Both the H2S and the H2O are bent if we look at their molecular geometries. So these will not be linear. So um, our, our polar bonds will cancel each other out in both of these cases. Um, in this one it will not. Which of the molecules has a dipole moment? Again, drawing them out. Pause your video here. We see that SF4 um, is our best option in this case. And if we do out our geometry, we'll see that we have a molecular geometry, which is Seesaw. Here's another uh, good example for you guys to go through, where we're asking, finding which of the following molecules has a dipole moment. Again, I would encourage you to pause the video and go through it. Um, PCL3. We, as we go through all these, PCL3 is the only one where we'll have a non-zero dipole moment. <clears throat> Which of the following statements about these species is false? Um, so again, this is kind of bringing in all the information we had this whole chapter, and we know that um, each uh, the bond in each pair is polar. So we're saying that N2CO and uh, CN minus and NO plus all have 10 valence shell electrons, which uh, uh, requires a triple bond. So this is true and this is true. Because they all involve two atoms, this is also true. They're all going to be linear. But each of the bond species is polar. N2 is, nitrogen is a relatively electronegative atom. However, it's bound to itself. We know that whenever we have an atom that is bound, bound to itself, it will never be a polar molecule, and it will never be a polar bond. Um, what is the approximate measure of the bond angle uh, about the carbon atom in the formaldehyde molecule? So we're giving you this Lewis structure here. When we see the H2, that means there's a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here on the carbon. So to be able to figure this out, you first need to figure out the electronic and the molecular geometry so you know which angle you're talking about. In this case, we're talking about 120 uh, degree angle between the carbon um, atom and the other molecules because we have three electronic groups, which means we have one electronic group for going to the oxygen and one to each hydrogen, which means three total groups around it. So they're evenly spaced 120 degrees apart from each other. Uh, what type of structure does xenon, uh, sorry, XeOF2 have? Um, again, to do this, you need to be able to draw the Lewis structure. Um, and from the Lewis structure, we can figure out the molecular ge or electronic geometry. And from the electronic geometry, we can figure out the molecular geometry. Um, we find out in this case, uh, we have five electron pairs. Three of them are bonding, which means two are non-bonding or lone pairs, which means the geometry in the molecular geometry would be T-shaped. And then lastly, which of the following statements best describes BF3 and NF3? Geometry refers to electron pair arrangements. So we're talking about the electronic, ge electronic geometry here, not the molecular geometry. 
They have different geometries and different shapes. If you draw out your Lewis structures, you will see that BF3 is trigonal planar, and because it has no lone pairs, it's also trigonal planar in its molecular geometry. So electronic geometry, molecular geometry. NF3, however, will have a lone pair. So it is tetrahedral in its electronic geometry, and it's trigonal pyramidal in its molecular shape. This concludes chapter eight. This is a lot of information. There are a lot of resources available to you on um, the extra help page for this unit. I would strongly encourage you to look at those as well as going through your homework and uh, the simulations that are provided on Canvas. Good luck, email me if you have any questions.